I'm keeping this group together, alive. The post-apocalyptic world of The Walking Dead acts like a psychological experiment. If we strip away our normal social conventions, what is human nature? Over the seasons, it becomes glaringly clear that the real danger to the characters isn't the walkers, but other human beings. And while everyone can agree on killing walkers, it's their attitudes on killing humans that really differ. In this treacherous world, each character and group must have a moral code to get through what they experience. They had a code. It was simple. Stupid. But it was some. So, in this Screen Prism series on The Walking Dead, we are going to look at various characters or groups and ask what their moral codes, values, and attitudes to violence tell us about who they are deep down. We'll start with the show's main character, Rick Grimes, leader of the Atlanta Survivors Group, which is also known simply as The Survivors. We stick together. As we track his evolution from principled sheriff's deputy to unapologetic killer, there is still something crucial and consistent that defines his morality. Rick Grimes saved my life over and over. There's terrifying people out there, and he rescued me from them. People like, like us need people like him. The key to Rick's motivation is his vision of a moral future and he'll do whatever it takes to ensure that his group lives to see it. But these people, these people are my family. And if what you're hiding somehow hurts them in any way, I'll kill you. Make me understand. I owe a debt to a man I met and, and his little boy, Lori. If they hadn't taken me in, I'd have died. In early seasons of the show, Rick holds on to his identity as a sheriff's deputy, acting as a defender of the old order of justice. Rick is newer to the apocalypse than the rest of his group, since he was in a coma when it occurred. So it's ironic that he becomes the group's leader. It's as if his abilities in the old world of law and order still matter most, and the group wants to incorporate these values into their future. Rick is still fighting crime, just on a greater scale. He's defending humanity. And maybe because of his background in law enforcement, he has a harder time than other characters accepting that the rules of morality have changed. Your friends draw on us. They gave us no choice. I'm sure we've all lost enough people. Done things we, we wish we didn't have to, but, but it's like that now, you know that. Rick is his group's and the show's moral compass. He's so pure that he feels sympathy even for walkers. I'm sorry this happened to you and will risk his life for people he barely knows. He has a strong sense of right and wrong, almost to a fault. His upstanding way of doing things actually puts others in jeopardy, which might remind us of one of our other favorite heroic TV characters. Rick insists on returning to Atlanta to rescue Merle Dixon after leaving him handcuffed on a roof. You're putting every single one of us at risk. Just know that, Rick. Looks for Sophia, even though this makes the group vulnerable to walkers. Little girl goes missing. You look for Sam and saves Randall, a total stranger. We couldn't just leave him behind. He would have bled out if he lived that long. The problem is that Rick wants to protect everyone. And in the world of the show, one person's safety usually comes at the expense of someone else's. Shane says my good intentions are making us weaker. That I can't make the hard decisions for the good of the group. They're all hard decisions. But maybe I'm holding on to a way of thinking that doesn't make sense anymore. Eventually, Rick has to face that obeying the old laws isn't always the same as doing the right thing in this complex new world. It may be noble to refuse to compromise his values even in times of crisis. I'm going back. But it's also not smart if doing so means certain death for people who depend on him. If something happened, I have to go. No, your place is here. Rick has to bend his rules for the group to have a future at all. The old sheriff's uniform he still wears in seasons one and two is a visual reminder of Rick's moral righteousness. When he puts it away, this symbolizes his acceptance that the moral code it represents just doesn't make sense anymore. And he begins building a new code from the ground up. Still, he's determined to preserve his son Carl's innocence, refusing to execute Randall when he realizes Carl is watching, and giving Carl his sheriff's hat in hopes of passing on the values he holds so dear to the next generation. Don't you miss it? Maybe you'll let me borrow it from time to time. 
Do what you need to do. So when he's out some balls and take care of this damn hey, bro. Hey, hey! We don't kill the living. Rick's character arc focuses on his coming to terms with the dark side of human nature, acknowledging that people are inclined towards violence as much as they are towards <laughs> compassion. Because this is how we survive. We tell ourselves that we are the walking dead. The walkers start as a physical threat, but evolve into a moral one, both because they embody what people may devolve into, and because they push people to act in violent, defensive ways that make them feel less than human. Rick is devastated by the revelation that the walker gene is a part of all human beings. He seems to connect this to his own capacity to kill. Whatever it is, we all carry it. Although human beings have both good and bad in them, if they all come back as walkers due to this disease of darkness, it suggests that people's essence boils down to the very worst, most animal versions of themselves. So many groups on the show prove this idea to be true, but Rick wants to prove it wrong by rebuilding a moral society. Yet Rick does have to accept violence to stay our hero. Throughout the show, we see that violence is necessary for the group's survival. To refuse to take part is actually cowardly, because it just passes the baton, putting the burden of being violent on others. Rick comes to understand that killing can be the courageous and right thing to do. A huge turning point comes when he kills his best friend, Shane. The act proves he's willing to sacrifice people he cares about if they jeopardize the group at large. You saw what he was like, how he pushed me, how he compromised us, how he threatened us. The group is more important than individual relationships because its size is protective, and one loose cannon puts everyone in danger. Still, whereas other characters easily adapt to violence, for Rick, the act of killing is emotional. It hurts him, bringing out guilt and remorse that speak to how durable his old inner morality still is. Damn you for making me do this shit! This was you, not me! You did this to us! This was you, not me! Not me! The intensity of his reaction to killing is directly tied to his feelings about the person he kills. Just think of how he sobs when he kills Shane and is almost bursting with rage in later killings. When he kills people who don't mean anything to him or who pose a less urgent threat, like Pete, he's much colder. Rick kills at least one person in every season of the show, except the first. And over time, he becomes less and less apologetic for violent actions. This comes to a head in season four when the claimers, Joe and Dan, threaten to rape Carl and Michonne. And Rick rips out Joe's jugular with his bare teeth. Rick's viciousness in this scene testifies to the intensity of his love. His primal ferocity still comes from that emotional place and demonstrates how, in the post-apocalyptic world, love and protectiveness can take a violent form. The brutality he shows in killing Gareth and the other cannibals in season five also comes after they threaten the people he loves most. Look, you're behind one of these two doors and we have more than enough firepower to take down both. Murder becomes life-giving, the only way to rescue people and keep them alive. But Rick's acceptance of violence reveals a fundamental change in his moral code. He no longer believes that most human beings are innately good. It's ironic that he's become so much like the realistic disillusioned Shane he used to clash with. When he lectures the Alexandrians who live in a totally insular community, he might as well be talking to his former self. Your way's gonna destroy this place. It's gonna get people killed. It's already gotten people killed. And I'm not gonna stand by and just let it happen. If you don't fight, you die. And unlike in the first few seasons, Rick now distrusts anyone who's not a part of his group. You're my brother. Each group on The Walking Dead is defined by what they live for. And Rick lives for his people. I've killed people. I don't even know how many by now. But I know why they're all dead. They're dead so my family, all those people out there, can be alive. And so I could be alive for them. Sounds like I'd want to be part of your family. 
In the early seasons, his wife Lori and Carl come before everyone else. But as the show goes on, we see that the group has taken the place of the nuclear family unit. Many of the group members have lost spouses and children, making the other survivors the only family they have. These are families. These are families too. Strong relationships are key to getting through tough times. And Rick has made himself the patriarch of this new family. He's a man with a good heart who feels the things he does, the things he has to do. And all of us who were together before this place, no matter when we found each other, we're family now. Rick started that. There's a deeper symbolism in the fact that many, when talking about the show, refer to Rick's group as simply the survivors, even though other groups are technically surviving too. Everything Rick's group does is shaped by the need to survive, but this group is also fighting to be spiritual human survivors, not just to continue living as something less than human. In this environment where the future of humanity is in doubt, Rick's adaptation of the family unit is revolutionary. Because while other groups give in to infighting and destruction, Rick's survivors are trying to rebuild society on a foundation of love, to grow a community of human beings who value each other. Rick's friendships are the reason he believes in that future at all. The group is the future. It's not your fault when people die. Not always, but sometimes, sometimes it is. Rick's moral code is also what makes villainous groups like the Saviors so eager to break him. When Negan commands Rick to cut off Carl's arm, saying that otherwise he'll massacre the entire group, Rick's shell-shocked expression shows us that hurting the people he loves is the most unnatural thing in the world to him. It can be finished, please! <laughs> and this look is exactly what Negan's been after. That is the look I wanted to see. In Negan's mind, it's proof that the strong relationships of the survivors are no match for true sadism. So it's as if Rick's moral code has failed. It sucks, don't it? The moment you realize you don't know shit. Negan's barbaric, self-serving, polygamous vision of the future is the polar opposite of Rick's. Like a shadow future he has to define and clarify his vision against. Initially, Rick makes himself accept Negan's rules to keep the group alive, so there's still hope for the future he imagines for his children. I'll die before she does, and I hope that's a long time from now so I can raise her and protect her and teach her how to survive. This is how we live now. I had to accept that too so I could keep everyone else alive. In a surprising way, Rick has come to embody the idea that the ends justify the means. He can put up with almost anything and break any rule that needs to be broken, if this keeps his family alive so that the loving moral future he believes in might one day come to pass. But when Negan's unpredictable ways make him too much of a danger to the group, Rick acknowledges the need to strike back because if they bend too far and don't fight the evils that seek to dominate them, that better future will likely never be possible. We're the ones who live. That's why we have to fight. Not for us, but for Judith, for Carl, for Alexandria, for the hilltop, for all of us. We can fight them. Rick needs his belief in a new day to come. It's what separates him from other groups. If we have no higher purpose than not dying, the result is total immorality and mindlessness, which is why some of the groups we meet aren't meaningfully different from the walkers. Rick may no longer be the rigid, unshakable leader we met in season one, but this actually makes him more human. And in the world of The Walking Dead, humanity is heroic. Ultimately, the walkers symbolize the danger of dehumanization. They look like people, but they're missing what makes us more. Rick leads his group and the show overall in finding a middle ground between humanity and violence, between morality and survivalism, between the means and the end. Even if his moral code has evolved, he retains his core values of love and loyalty. And it's because of his code that he hasn't been inwardly destroyed by his killings. Rick's belief in the future is really a belief in the underlying goodness of humanity and the sacred importance of preserving that goodness at all costs. 
And this faith that deep down we're good, instead of just waiting to become walkers, is what's needed for humanity to have any chance of persevering through darkness. Rick's hope for that happy, safe future makes him not just a moral leader, but a visionary. I can sacrifice one of us for the greater good because, because we are the greater good. <laughs>